Welcome to the Foreign Policy Week in Review with Daniel McAdams of the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Well, I've arranged with with Daniel to do an update uh, of a few of the most important foreign policy news events of uh, each week to try to help us understand what's really going on as opposed to the mainstream pablum that we get day in and day out. Thanks, uh, Daniel, for joining me again this week. Thanks, Jay. It's good to be back with you. Always good to talk to you, and there's always so much to talk to you about, or you for, you to talk to us about, I should say, because I'm not the one uh, that knows much about this. In fact, I find this a an easy way for me to learn a little bit about what's going on. And I know you're doing all the hard work, you and the other folks at the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, and all of you guys work for... You certainly aren't uh, driving Maseratis and, and living <laughs> and, and living high on the hog. You're, you're, uh, you're you, you know. You, you found out my secret. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're you're a hard worker, Daniel. So I'm not sure. Um, but hey, look, there's things other than money that matter. Sometimes truth is very important, and I know that's what the Ron Paul Institute is about: uh, exposing what's really going on. And if the American people had a clue about what is going on if we could get through to more and more people I think some real changes could be made because I think Americans would be mad as hell and they wouldn't take it anymore if they really understood what was going on but uh, you know a few topics I'd like to ask you about today Daniel Um, one was I thought it was really interesting a discussion uh, on the Ron Paul Liberty Report with uh, Michael Scheuer and the title of the topic and this is a video that I would encourage people to go watch at the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity website, but it's titled, Why is Terrorism on the the Rapid Rise? After we've been spending huge amounts of money to fight, supposedly to fight terrorism since 9-11, it's not on the decline at all. If anything, it's accelerating. So could you perhaps just give us an overview of what uh, uh, Mr. Scheuer was saying on on this uh, television show, and then I'd like to encourage people to go listen. It's about 14 minutes long for people to go listen to the entire, um, the entire discussion. Yeah, well, it's what it was is a discussion about a a report that came out um, at the end of last year, but it was a survey of world terrorism through the year of ni- of 2014. And what it discovered, you know, essentially was this: after 14 years of the war on terror, trillions of dollars spent, thousands of lives lost. Uh, in 2014, there was more terrorism uh, in any year since uh, 2001, mm. and it's and it's on a rapid increase. And the other thing that's that's in, that's interesting in the in the investigation was that terrorism is highest in places where the U.S. is conducting either military or destabilization activities. So it's you know there appears to be a direct correlation between uh, an interventionist U.S. foreign policy and an increase in terrorism. So that means that the, uh, uh, the neocons and the other interventionists are saying that we have to fight terrorism with more U.S. troops and more intervention are, are just full of it. They're blowing smoke. It sounds like it's a negative correlation. The more you spend, the less you get. Yeah, uh, or the more terrorism you get. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's, uh, you know, you're not, uh, you're not only not getting a bang for your buck, you're getting a negative bang for your buck. Yeah, it's it's right. uh you know it's just it's just you know it's it, again it's so reminiscent of of economic policy in my view which is what I follow and look at monetary policy and economic policy in the United States the more of that we get the worse things get the more the more money is printed the worse things get and of course a lot of the money is being printed to sponsor some of this uh, ter- our own activities around the world and uh, you know I'd like to talk to you. Uh, ask you about uh, Macedonia. It looks like there's some things going on there now that uh, looks like another color revolution in Macedonia. Daniel, could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think it's definitely shaping up, and we've we've got uh, one of our one of our correspondents is preparing a piece right now to look a little more closely into it. But to, g- to give you a kind of a thumbnail background on it, and I encourage people to do some more reading because it is. It is somewhat esoteric, but it's 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 still it's actually quite important. Uh, the parallels with with Ukraine are actually quite striking. But if uh, you've, you, I'm sure your listeners are well aware that the South Stream uh, pipeline was canceled mm-hmm. after the the uh, the U.S. successfully uh, put pressure on Bulgaria to pull out, and then in December of 2014, uh, 
uh, Russian President Putin went to Turkey and struck up a deal with the Turks to start a Turk stream pipeline mm -hmm. that would go a bit further south, that would bypass Bulgaria, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> pardon me, and then a branch would go up through Macedonia. And the Macedonians, uh, the, the current Macedonian government uh, of Nikola Grievsky agreed to this. Mm -hmm. and, and since then, there have been repeated destabilization events in Macedonia. One of the most significant being um, the release of hundreds of thousands of secretly recorded conversations of government officials. Uh, and f from what I've read, saying some some pretty nasty things, you know, about uh, uh, undermining their opponents and this sort of thing. Uh, several several of the, the government ministers involved have resigned, and I think one of them's in jail for, for some of the things they said. But uh, it's, it's got the, the population in an, in an uproar, these, these recorded speeches, but the suspicion is that it was an outside intelligence agency that was surreptitiously uh, recording these things and is letting them out in uh, in trickles to undermine the Macedonian government, and I think we we probably can guess which government that might be, mm -hmm. <laughs> if we've paid attention to what Snowden has said about U.S. spying. Uh, so that's on one track. You have this destabilization on that, and the opposition uh, is taking advantage of the uh, of of people legitimately being irritated at how badly some of these people have behaved. And you know, of course, Jay, we don't have. That kind of thing going on here, you know. No, no, no. Our, no. our government officials only say nice things when they're being well, uh, nice and truthful things, of course. Exactly, and you also uh, this is another key component that makes it look more like a color revolution. You have all of these pseudo NGOs in Macedonia that are that are really amplifying and pushing these things up. Uh, the Societas Civilius, uh, the civil society. Institute for Democracy is putting out all this stuff. And of course, if you go to their website and you scroll down to the bottom, you see major sponsors, the U.S. Embassy. You know? oh. <laughs> so they're pushing U.S. foreign policy of undermining this Macedonian government for going along with the Turkish, uh, the Turk stream pipeline. And um, adding to, I don't, I don't want to get too far into the weeds. I know it's a lot to digest. And frankly, I mean, it's complicated. I don't know that I fully understand all of these different threads. But the other interesting um, uh, part of the equation is that there is a, a rapid uptick in Albanian, ethnic Albanian terrorism oh, in Macedonia. So it's kind of a two-prong. If you remember, it really took violence in Ukraine to really uh, get things moving. There, people were protesting on the street for quite some time, mm -hmm. and it took, it took the violence to really get things uh, moving on it. So you see several incursions of Albanian terrorists, including a group that we all thought was dismantled, the Kosovo Liberation Army, has, has moved from Kosovo into, into Macedonia and uh, has started attacking uh, Macedonians. So it's, there is going to be a huge protest this Sunday, ostensibly about these, these leaked documents, these intercepted phone calls. Uh, essentially, it's the opposition saying, we're going to start occupying government buildings. This is just like the Maidan in Ukraine. Uh, so the big showdown is going to be on Sunday. Uh, we know that Victoria Nuland has been involved with Macedonia, so she was a central figure uh, in the Ukrainian overthrow. And ironically, uh, she had a phone call intercepted as... I'm sure your listeners remember, but nothing mm -hmm. ever bad happened to her for no. her colorful comments about the EU. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So it's a it's a big nutshell. But in a nutshell, what's happening from everything that I can see is that the U.S. is behind a serious destabilization effort in Macedonia that may well in the next few days culminate in either extreme violence uh, or some sort of a regime change. So keep an eye on Macedonia. And I think from a bigger picture point of view, again, from my, at least the way I see it, Daniel, is that this is all about the petrodollar. And I keep going back to this notion of what gives the dollar value. Kissinger had to go and make an arrangement to have the world pay for their oil uh, in uh, dollars. After Nixon took us off the gold standard, there was no reason to own dollars unless you had to have them for some international trade reason. So I think, you know, they don't want Putin selling gas into Europe. And this pipeline is supposed to go uh, through Turkey into Greece 
And as I understand it, uh, there's one branch that would then extend up in towards uh, some of the other European countries and over another one over into Italy. That's my understanding of it, Daniel. So that, yes. so that, so that Putin is wanting to sell gas into the West and, and uh, his petroleum products. And the United States doesn't want any part of that because it wants to dominate and control the oil trade so it can uh, demand... Uh, demand payment at least as for as much as possible to retain the dollar's hegemony around the, around the world. Absolutely, Jay. And ironically, these U.S. moves to destabilize and to prevent the Russians from selling their – I thought we were pro-free market, by the way, and pro-free trade, but apparently it doesn't well, count for, uh, for Russian oil and gas. <laughs> only, only, when, uh, only when you can dominate and control the markets and you like yeah. free trade. Yeah, well, that's... So ironically, this, that, that, sorry to interrupt you, Jay, but ironically, yeah. these moves that it's doing are pushing Russia into the hands of China and India, and, uh, and, uh, and they're more than happy to buy this stuff. And what this does really is, 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 as you said, this will undermine the dollar as a world currency because the more important Russian trade with China and India gets in non-dollar trade, the less important the dollar is worldwide. That's right. That's, and, that, that's exactly right. And, of course, uh, that's, I think, of course, that's why uh, I think why Obama and uh, the Council of Foreign Relations and the people that really run the world are more interested also in trying to control the Asian trade as well, which takes me to another topic I'd like to ask you about, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. You know, Daniel, this was something that was brought to my attention a couple of years ago. I had a, a guest on the show that had worked with Lou Dobbs, who was very much uh, working hard to try to keep the uh, to lobby people. Uh, I don't know if lobby is the right word because I don't think he was getting paid. I think he was just really believing very firmly in, in, uh, you know, in free trade and believed that the Trans-Pacific Partnership is the antithesis of free trade. Anyway, um, he was working really hard uh, against it, and we saw last week, I think it was the Democrats that voted very overwhelmingly, the, Democratic, uh, the Democrats in the Senate, or was it in the House? I, I can't remember. In the Senate. It was, it was in the Senate. In, in the yeah. Senate. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, I believe, leading the charge, and uh, so the Democrats voted very much against and turn, went against uh, President Obama on this issue. Uh, but tell us where that's at. It seems as though they're they're offering some some goodies to the to the people that didn't vote for it, perhaps to try to buy them off, so that because it seems the the people that really want this, of course, are the large banking interests, the large corporate interests. Uh, it seems to be always the those are the parties that want to see these major trade, so-called free trade uh, initiatives go through. Yeah, but the key also is to to um, sweeten the pie for the prog so-called progressives as well, and that's uh -huh. what happened in the Senate. You know, there was a there was a danger of a, of a veto of them not being able to. Uh, to withstand a veto on this on this on this uh -huh. bill, yeah, and uh, the as you say, the progressives led the charge, threatening that you won't have enough votes to get through, and so essentially, what what the um, what the administration did is it sweetened the pie with uh, adding a couple of concessions. I think it was uh, things like um, uh, wage protections and a couple of things of this nature. But, you know, this is always what happens in these deals. Uh, all the big drama really doesn't uh, lead to anything different. It always goes through. It really is a, a charade. They want to, they want to extract their, uh, their pound of flesh, and so they pretend to oppose it. But there's no question that, uh, that now it looks like it's going to go through the Senate. And uh, so a lot of drama for not very much, you know, reality. So there may be an element of, uh, of, of true unhappiness about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but what you're saying is it's a lot of it is posturing so that it might have looked as if the Democrats would really oppose it, but uh, a lot of them are sort of lukewarm on the issue at best, and they're, and they're willing to, to vote the other way if they, get their, uh, if they stomp and, and cry and raise hell enough, they'll get, maybe get what they want, and then they'll vote for it. Yeah, and as as your your listeners are aware, one of the one of the um, you know privacy groups and 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 government openness groups have been concerned, you know, including things like the um, uh, like the Electronic Frontier Foundation have been concerned because the the TPP, which will be facilitated by the passage of this fast track legislation, the Trans Pacific Partnership, is an absolutely secretive deal. Yeah, uh, Americans can't see it and have not seen it. The only people who can see it are congressmen who go into a super secret facility on Capitol Hill. They can't bring their notes with them uh, when they leave. Uh, 
Uh, so is this the way, is this transparency in government? So it's, um, it's, it's a super secret deal. Nobody knows what's in it. We can suspect uh, what might be in it, but it's certainly just on principle if the Senate uh, was anything remotely like the Senate in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a society under the rule of law would vote against it on principle. All right. Well, it's my understanding that the Trans-Pacific Partnership will have its own uh, court system. So if there are disputes... Uh, the the laws that are the laws or regulations that are granted to, to the TPP will prevail for all the countries that are signatories to the agreement, and I don't know how many there are. There's at least 13 or something. Maybe there's more than that now, but I know some of our allies like Japan. I think there's some Islamic countries in Asia that are parties to it. Uh, Chile, maybe Peru, maybe Mexico, Canada, and it's my understanding, Daniel, that. You know that again. It's not. It won't be U.S. law again. It's the removal of sovereignty from the nations and putting it in the hands of fewer, uh, putting it in the hands of a few people essentially that create the regulations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Yeah, and that, that was exactly the case in the, with the WTO. So you know, it created a special court to adjudicate uh, you know decisions that were you know that were supranational. So that will no doubt happen with the TPP as well. That's what I understand. So, for example, if I'm a, a mining company, a U.S. mining company, I have to comply with U.S. Uh, environmental regulations, for example. And if the TPP's regulations are less severe than uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's regulations, uh, I still have to, if I'm a, an American mining company, still have to comply with the laws of the U.S., Whereas the Canadians or somebody else could come in here and not have to be nearly as uh, as encumbered by those laws, and their cost they would have a cost advantage over over me. Uh, so that's you know in theory that's the way I understand the bill. And you know, is there one in a thousand Americans who can even talk at all about the TPP? I doubt it. Nor are we supposed, as you point out, we're not supposed to know anything about it. We're just supposed to be agreeable <laughs> with the man in the White House, I guess. Because as the press falsely uh, reports, this is free trade. But of course, it's not free trade. It's managed trade. Uh, any, any, and everything we've just been talking about, Jay, is about managing the trade. You yeah. Know, if, as Dr. Paul said on a recent episode of his Liberty Report, uh, if Congress were to pass a free trade bill, it would simply uh, pass a piece of legislation establishing the tariff between the U.S. and country X at zero. Right. Or at or at oh, one yeah. percent or what have you. That's that's how you do a free trade bill. Exactly right. That would be free trade. And yeah. and who couldn't support that? Well, I suppose all the people that are supporting this wouldn't support yeah. that because it would give an even playing field to the people that aren't in charge of these. I mean, who makes up the rules for the TPP, for example? Well, it's the signatories, I suppose. All the governments get together, but who influences the American? I mean, if we're not allowed to know, somebody knows. Somebody in, uh, you know, that's close to the seat of power, will be forming these regulations in their favor against the uh, against against the common folks. And this is, I don't know, it's just sad. But you know, we're that's why we talk about this stuff, Daniel, and why I'm so glad that you spend the time you do uh, talking about it, because at least some people, and a growing number of people. Uh, I'm very heartened by the uh, by the knowledge that there are quite a few people that listen to this discussion that you and I have. We'd just like to say that all of you who are listening out there, please go to the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. Uh, make a habit of going there on a regular basis so you can educate yourself as to what's going on. And, uh, you know, if your conscience guides you, please give a little money to the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity. You guys have been through two years now, Daniel, so congratulations on that. Thanks, Jay. And, uh, That's true. Boy, we need need to see you get out to more and more people, and more money would help do that. So if there's any chance for liberty, it has to be, I think it was Thomas Jefferson that said that um, eternal vigilance is uh, the price of liberty or some something yeah. to that effect. Exactly. Uh, so we need to be vigilant. We need to try to understand what's really going on, and thank you, Daniel, for your vigilance. Anything else you might want to add this week before we... Uh, conclude our discussion well i to be honest my 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 brain is caught up in macedonia i think something big is going to happen there and it's uh, it's very frightening that uh, the russians are going to see something that they're very interested in having done being once again thwarted by the u.s and it makes you wonder how much they're going to take yeah how how long will the russians put up with this stuff you know 
How long will the Russian people? I mean, and uh, do the Rush? Do you think the Russian people uh, have the same kind of kinship? Probably not, as they have with the Ukraine. I mean, they don't have this sort of closeness with Macedonia. They wouldn't have. No, not necessarily. They 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 do with with Serbia to a degree, but not as much with Macedonia. Although you know, Macedonia is a very complex country with a very complex uh, ethnic mixture, and uh, uh, there are a great many Slavs. Uh, who live in Macedonia, but uh, that's that's one of the factors in it. But it is, I think, it's an incredibly dangerous situation. Yeah, I was reading that there's um, not necessarily that the uh, that the Macedonians will uh, will really go f- will really be so so happy about this heavy-handed NATO involvement, or let's say uh, it, it will it will evolve to that. I guess if you look at the progression of these things, first uh, you have the NGOs that go in there and 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 taunt. Uh, the people that are doing certain things that other people don't like and try to create chaos and, uh, and, and disruption and overthrow of the government. Then we put in, we, I say, the ruling elite puts in who they want, the NGOs, uh, George Soros and people like Victoria Nuland. They, they get their person in office so that they can then get their own way and block Putin, I suppose. That's the game. That's the end game. I guess they think they'll be successful. I don't know. <laughs> and they think they'd be successful, but you have to wonder, you know, how much, uh, how much will the BRIC countries, primarily Russia and China, take? And then on the other side of the world, uh, uh, in Asia, of course, uh, you know, again, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is aimed in large part to try to offset Chinese uh, uh, growth, of Chinese power in that part of the world, I guess. So, yeah. it's a big geopolitical. I mean, these are little pawns. Uh, these little countries are like pawns on a chessboard, aren't they? Uh, and, it seems that way. Jay. And the people don't matter. The people yeah. don't matter at all. All right, Daniel. Well, thank you very much again, and uh, look forward to talking to you next week on some of the major topics of of the upcoming week. And as you suggest, probably keep your eye on Macedonia. Thanks thank very you. much, Jay. 